At your deathbed, you've lived a film. We don't come to Earth for a long time. We come for a very short amount of time. For most people in the sidelines was the second film. The hell with it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna quit my job, I'm gonna become a writer. For whatever reason, and whether you didn't have the courage or the curiosity or the confidence, it never came to be. We finished training the horses, and we started the journey. And the purpose and the reason we do the do. Must is just who you are. This is your life. Seize the day. Is to narrow the distance between those two films. I am encouraged by your presence. My journey starts off in 1983. I had, I had been in the United States Marine Corps for three years. I did well in the Marine Corps. I actually, when I was in uh, Singapore and Thailand on the journey over the Indian Ocean, I received a Humanitarian Service Award for helping out uh, people who were being placed on the ship. So the Marine Corps was very good to me for three years. But then I was stationed in Camp, Camp Pendleton, California. And a group of Marines and myself went to a drug dealer's apartment in 1983. And I took the life of another human being. I was subsequently arrested. A trial was had. The jury was comprised of nine men and three women. The nine men all voted to convict me of first degree murder. Could have possibly suffered the death penalty, and that would have meant that I would, would have been executed by the state of California. The three women said no. What prompted that, I have no idea. But it saved my life. The trial ended in a mistrial. The second trial, 11 men and one woman, but I was still found not guilty of first degree murder. So that means I didn't get sentenced to death. I didn't get sentenced to 25 years to life without the possibility of parole. I got sentenced to 15 years to life with the possibility of parole. The attorneys told me at the time that I would possibly do 10 to 15 years. I got sent to a level three prison, Soledad. It was very violent. I was not a gang member. I was not from California. So I had no allegiance to a particular neighborhood or a street. I was pretty much alone in a very crowded prison, which makes an easy uh, target. Uh, fortunately, I had learned quite a bit in the Marine Corps uh, with self-defense. And unfortunately, I got into an incident. There was another violent incident. The other person survived, and I survived. But I was sent to the most maximum of all maximum prisons that the state of California had, and that was San Quentin State Prison Isolation Unit which shared a recreational yard with death row inmates, human beings that have been sentenced to die. Uh, when I say recreational yard, that's almost a misnomer. It's a concrete space, a small area of concrete surrounded by a perimeter fence. And it's a gunman at the top of the fence. This was called a recreational yard. And it was anything but. When we would get sent to that yard, there would inevitably, inevitably, inevitably be violence. And I found out very quickly that the way the prison administration responded to inmate on inmate violence was that in 10 days, they would investigate the incident. Every incident took 10 days. But after the 10th day, they would put us back out there on that recreational yard. And there would be other incidents. So I was wondering when my time was going to come. When will I be faced with death? Because 
understandably, if a death row inmate were to, I'm going to take a moment to just wipe my brow. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like a Baptist preacher when I get to talking. <laughs> Thank you for being so kind. <laughs> Death row inmates. Of course, the state couldn't sentence them to die twice. So if one of those inmates were to have a bad day and take it out on me, not too much could happen to them. So it was very violent. Uh, fortunately, after months and months and months, uh, I was able to convince the committee uh, that I needed to be out of that situation, that I didn't need that type of restriction and punishment, uh, that I could conduct myself in a manner that would not be violent. And that was denied, but the chairman told me to come back and he said, you know, if we take this chance and put you out in our general population, uh, if you do anything else, you'll never get out of here. And I says, I understand that and I accept that. You know, he's a prison administration, uh, administrator. His job is all about safety. That's understandable. And I was subsequently uh, released from the isolation unit, death row inmates, inmates that I had spent a lot of time with. But I was sent to another prison, a maximum security prison. It was in the elk of the Pelican Bay prison now. It was actually the first uh, new maximum prison that the uh, state of California built. And it was built back in the late 80s. And we actually opened that prison up. The walls of the cells were still wet, as a matter of fact, when they put us in there. I think they put us in there before it was time for us to go, but I guess they wanted to fulfill their quota they wanted to get the project done under the time, so they put us in there. And since it was not quite finished, we stayed locked up in the cells for six months. In isolation unit, I was in a cell, a small cell by myself, where I could touch one wall and I could touch another wall. In the back of the cell, there was the toilet and a sink. In the front of the cells, there were bars. And that's how big that cell was. But I was in that cell by myself in the isolation unit. In this new maximum prison that I was sent to, the cells were somewhat bigger, but now there's two people in that cell. So every day and every night, 24 hours a day, we had to stand there together for six months. And multiply that one cell by all the cells that was in that building. That's how many human beings were locked up for six months. And it was a uh, constant violence, you know, people getting into fights because, you know, you can possibly get tired of a person after a little while, <laughs> especially if you have to be in there six months. Uh, and when we were released to the general population, when they opened up the yard to us, uh, there was a lot of, of violence. But I had time to ponder. I, I had time to think, why, why, why is my life so cluttered with violence? I mean, I grew up in the housing projects of Chicago. I know that. And it was violent. I went into the Marine Corps for three years, and I learned all these things, and it was violent. Then in prison, and I said, there must be a way to extract myself from all of this violence. And it was no epiphany or anything. I just wanted to save my life. I wanted to live. I wanted to live, but I, 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 I couldn't figure out how to do that, how to escape from the violence when I'm in the violence. How can I escape from the violence in a prison that was inherently violent? There was, there was thought. There was consideration, and I had always heard about education. People always say, well, education is the way out. Educate the mind, educate the individual. It's always the way out. So I took that. I went the route of education. 
Every program that I could get involved with, I got in it. I want to correct John Kelly in a little while, because I did get my bachelor's degree already in psychology. <laughs> And summa cum laude. <laughs> that means straight A's with the highest honors. That came later. It did. It came later. I had went through an educational program uh, in uh, uh, the California Men's Colony Prison, and it was for X-ray technicians. And they they weren't allowing a lot of people in that program. And I was pretty fortunate to get in that program. The only way I got in there is because I got transferred to that one prison because. The, uh, uh, the associate warden had said that there's a long-term stress program for individuals who had been in the isolation unit for a long time. And I says, wow, I fit that criteria. I need to go into a stress program. I need to de-stress, right? And uh, so they shipped me over to that prison. I got to the prison, and immediately when I got off the bus in that prison, because I was shackled and, and, sh and chained, they took me and locked me up in the uh, ad SAG unit. And I got a little slip of paper under the door that says, uh, this inmate does not fit the criteria because he has a proclivity towards weapons and violence. And this was before I started going to school, so I had to look up the word proclivity. Uh, proclivity? So no one had talked to me. I hadn't talked to a, a human being. No one had talked to me. They, they made a decision, getting off the bus, by just looking at my, my file, what was written on the paper about me. And they said, well, we can't have this guy in this facility. And I'm thinking, wow, I must be really bad when another prison doesn't want to accept me. And so I sat there in that ass seg, and I didn't know what to do. But I wanted to, I had a plan, I had a purpose. I wanted to be there so I could take advantage of those education programs. So I couldn't, I couldn't fail at this. I had to get it done. This was my life. So a porter walked by, and I stopped the porter. I says, hey, how you doing? He says, how you doing? What did you do to get in there? I said, I've done nothing. I've done nothing. I just got off the bus. He said, you just got off the bus, and they locked you up? I says, yes. He said, well, let me see what I can do about that. And he left. And then I'm thinking, you know, maybe I, I'm still insane because this guy who's the janitor is going to talk to somebody about getting me out of ad sag. It doesn't work that way, really. Uh, but he came back later that day and he said, I went and talked to the captain. He remembers you from Soledad Prison almost 10 years ago. I said, great. Excellent. And then he left, and I, and I sat back on the bed, and again, I thought, well, you know, you can't put too much credence in that. But isn't it something about the human condition that when you put something out there in the universe, when you ask for something, isn't it amazing how support comes? And that next day, I heard steps coming down the tier. The tier is what we call the tier. It's a, really a floor. Coming down the tier. And the steps were very official sounding. And so I got up off the bunk, and I walked up to the cell bars. And this guy came, and he stopped, and he said, I'm captain. And I'm, I looked at him, and I said, captain, uh, I've done nothing. I just want to come in here. I want to educate myself. I want to take advantage of these programs, and I want to do better. He says, you know, Alexander, I wish I could help you, but I don't know if I can do that. I mean, you've done some terrible things in your life. They have you down. It's very dangerous. I says, give me this opportunity. You will not, I'm telling you, you will not be disappointed. And so he left without saying yay or nay. I got a request to come in front of the committee. And I came in front of the committee. And the chairperson of the committee was a lady. And she talked to me face to face, eye to eye. And she says, you know what? We're going to take a chance and let you out there. I says, you will not be disappointed. When I got out there in that prison, that prison into their programs, 
by the end of two years, I had my Associate of Arts degree, I had my electronic technician's license, and I had my x-ray technician's license. Two years at that place, and I don't think they were disappointed. <laughs> I went, got a phone call from my x-ray instructor. He says, out of all the people that went through our program, we have a job that just came open in San Quentin State Prison, and I want to recommend you for that position as an inmate x-ray technician. And I says, oh my goodness. No, well, the first time I was at San Quentin was not too nice, so I don't know if I want to go back there. <laughs> and he says, you cannot leave this opportunity. You have to take it. This is your life. Take this opportunity. And I says, you're right. I have to do it. I can't allow fear to stop me. So I went back to San Quentin, got into the x-ray department, I cleaned up the place, I got the files organized, and I got the machine, and I was taking x-rays. I was taking x-rays on reception center inmates, general population inmates, and death row inmates. On this one particular occasion, occasion two officers escorting the sergeant in the front, escorting this, this huge inmate into my x-ray department. The sergeant comes up and he says, uh, do you want us to take the chains off of him so you can do the x-rays, or can you take the x-rays with the chains still on him? And so I looked at this guy, this huge guy, and he looks down at me, and, and it seemed to me that he had a tear in his eye, and he said, uh, how did this happen? How did you go from that guy that was in isolation unit sharing a yard with us on death row to this person where this sergeant is asking you if it's okay to take the chains off of me. How did that happen? And when he asked me that question, I, had, I really had no answer. I had no answer. But I really wanted to find an answer. I was very curious to know, how did that happen? And yes, we did. I said, please take the chains off of Mr. Williams. Uh, took you. Uh, so uh, we actually um, pursued that question with earnest. So I knew I had the educational part of it down, the, the, the left brain down. I knew I had that. So it was some spiritual that was missing, I think. And so I went about trying to find out what it was. And I found the Kairos program, K-A-I-R-O-S. John Kelly was part of the Kairos program, and of course, Gene Kirkham is part of the Kairos program. And I got into that, and these men came in, and they talked to us. They shared their hearts with us and told us their stories, and they treated us like human beings. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is wonderful. This is spectacular. Why am I spending 16 hours a day in the x-ray department? I need to have more of this. And it started with them coming in, showing me that example of a human being helping another human being without the label, you know, without the label of prisoner or convict or anything like that, just human being helping other human beings. And I thought about it, I said, that's what hope is all about. Hope is about helping other people endure. And they was helping us endure. And I wanted to do that with other people. So I got involved in other programs, Alternatives to Violence Project, so I could help other individuals. I learned about coping skills and ways to treat other human beings without having to be threatening or intimidating, to be understanding, to be compassionate. So Gene Kirkham came back to my life. Uh, I met him in 1995, and in 2004, he, he says, why are you still in prison? I mean, you, you're doing good. I mean, why are you still in prison? And he asked that question. I said, Gene, I don't have an answer. You know, you can always say, well, well, it's a conservative administration. Who knows? But he wanted to do something about it. I mean, the man has been in his business many years, and he's done everything. He didn't need to give up his time, life, and efforts. He didn't need to do it. He introduced me to his wife and his daughter. I mean, wow. So he told me in 2004, he says, I'm going to get my attorney's license renewed, and I'm going to represent you in front of the California Board of Parole hearings. So of course, you know, I cried. Tears was all over my body, right? 
I couldn't stop. I mean, a, amazing grace. This man did not have to do that with his life. So in 2006, we went in front of the California Board of Parole hearings. I had been denied many times before that when I went in by myself or with their appointed lawyer. But when I went in with Gene Kirkham and we sat down and we presented our case and they heard the evidence, I had been in, in 2006, I had been locked in prison for 23 years at that time. The parole board was chaired by a man who used to be, I believe, a district attorney in Humboldt County. And he was a very conservative individual. He had a reputation to be, of being very tough. He sat there as the chairman, he told us, he says, you are suitable for parole. And he signed a parole release form, and the other board agreed. The board has four months to look through that process. And through that process, they, look, they make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and they found me suitable for release. So family and friends, we all got our heart up. We're thinking that this is it. But the governor had 30 days to decide whether or not I should go out. And on the 30th day, the governor rejected the parole board's decision and denied my release. This went on again in 2007, 2008. Gene Kirkham stayed with it all that way. No one left. As a matter of fact, they took a vigil to Sacramento. They sung songs. <laughs> In 2009, I think it was, they sung songs and they appeared before the administration, but again, there was nothing. There was lawsuits filed. In 2011, the California Court of Appeals said that the governor in 2006 and 2007 had abused his discretion. And the California Court of Appeals ordered my immediate release in 2011. And I came out into society in 2011 after 28 years in prison. Wow, I got a job. I wanted to help people, helping other people endure. I wanted to help people. I got a job as a counselor in the Napa Valley and in the Sonoma Valley. As a matter of fact, they said that I was so, uh, so well suited to helping people with alcohol and drug problems yeah, because <laughs> I wasn't judgmental and I wasn't critical, right? How could I judge anybody? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said that, you know, I tell all my clients, no one is worth more or worth less. No one is worth more or worth less than you. We're all human beings in this life trying to find our way. Don't stop growing. Don't get down and disappointed. You can achieve. You can come out of any chaotic situation. Even in the darkest place, you can find that light of hope, helping other people endure. So the quote I want to leave you with, thank you. The quote I want to leave you with is this. Martin J. Buber said that all real living, all real living is meeting, is meeting. All real living is meeting in this present moment. In this present moment, I get to meet all of you. I am and will always be encouraged by your presence. <laughs>